Delray, I'm out here in front of the in front of the uh, Hollywood Athletic Club. Uh, before we start this video, I wanted to give everybody basically uh, the truth about that photo that night. That photo was actually taken upstairs in the Hollywood Athletic Club. They actually had like a pool room, like a VIP area upstairs. You got Pac, you got Faith, you got the girl Nikki. And the other guy in the back, I didn't really know who he was. But then the two guys to the right, the guy with the glasses on, is actually Roland Work. And he was the guy who was the promoter of the club, the number one black promoter in Hollywood at that particular time. You know what I mean? Handling his business. And the guy behind him, may rest in peace, who passed recently, old Robert Betts. Robert Betts was a good dude. That's the breakdown on the picture that night. Uh, let's get on with this video. Most people listen with the intent to respond and not the intent to understand. How did Faith Evans end up in Tupac's hotel room the same night she met him at the Hollywood Athletic Club? I can tell you that Tupac didn't ask her. She volunteered. I was present for that conversation. I'm going to explain how and where it happened. But first, I'm going to give you two parallel situations as it relates to Tupac Shakur and Michael Jackson that occurred after their death, and how their false accusers were given print and visual media platforms to carry out a failed attempt to tarnish their legacy. When Michael Jackson was alive, a guy by the name of James Safechuck said that Michael Jackson was a great guy. And when Tupac Shakur was alive, Faith Evans said that Tupac was very nice to her. Some years after Michael Jackson's death, James Safechuck in the documentary Leaving Neverland said that Michael Jackson sexually molested him from 1988 until 1992 inside of a room at the train station at Neverland Ranch up until he was 14 years old. Ironically, Faith Evans said something similar in her memoir about Tupac allegedly sexually harassing her. But upon viewing the city building and construction permits, it was factually proven that the construction timeline on the train station at Neverland Ranch did not start until the latter part of 1993. And upon further research, it was proven that James Safe Chuck was lying because the train station room wasn't even built when he was allegedly abused. And it's also been factually proven that the timeline that Faith Evans provided in her book was 26 days different from the actual day she alleged that Tupac sexually harassed her, making it mathematically impossible to have occurred. The only difference between Faith Evans and James Safechuck is he told his lies about Michael Jackson in the documentary, and she told her lies about Tupac Shakur in the book. Lies run sprints, but the truth runs marathons. Follow me. Tupac was a very calculated individual who never had to force a woman to do anything. They usually did it warningly and willingly, and Faith Evans was no exception. What most people fail to realize is that the only reason why I spoke this truth about what really happened involving Faith and Tupac was because of the Drink Champs interview and upon doing more research, the Vlad TV interview, as well as the Breakfast Club interview. I never knew Faith Evans wrote a book, the first time I had heard about it was through those various interviews and upon further research of other articles in various magazines. After hearing her blatantly replace the truth with her lies by saying that Tupac sexually harassed her and threatened to withhold payment for the song she recorded with him unless she gave him oral sex when she knowingly and willingly had sex with Tupac on October 19, 1995, after that studio session. Calculation part one, 
do you think that when Chuck Phillips arrived at the studio on the 19th of October to do Tupac's first interview after he was released from prison on October 12, 1995, was a journalistic coincidence? I know we didn't talk before, so I said, fuck it. Talking chat. I'm glad you did it, man. <laughs> So, which one to talk about? Well, let's talk about what's happening. You've been in the studio for like, what, four days? When you start? I've been in the studio since the day I got out. Chuck Phillips was called to the studio that day because he was a trusted journalist. And the interview that he would be conducting that day with Tupac would also capture Tupac and Faith Evans not only working together, but would also capture the fact that she was comfortable and not under any duress. <laughs> You want to add live? You are very un- Oh, money, don't do that. That don't do this shit. Okay, okay, okay. You want to go to another room? All right. No, the background. And why are y'all leaving with the food? Huh? You ready to go? Okay, let me... I told you to go to that track where it says stick. Stick. I don't need that. You don't need that? I do not need that. You probably need that. That's why I said go to that and check. So we ready? Yeah. Stick was on, just something that was there. No, no necessity for that. You ready? Uh-huh. Are you ready? If the background's too loud, just speak up. You're saying, uh... Don't let Pop do the fucking hell is. Why not? Uh-huh. All right, chill out. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Here we go. Coming in. Calculation part two. When Chuck Phillips and the LA Times released that article from that interview titled, I Am Not a Gangster, on October 25th, 1995, do you think it was a mistake that Chuck Phillips didn't mention the fact that the wife of the notorious B.I.G., Faith Evans, was in the studio happily recording a song called You Wonder Why They Call You Bitch with Tupac Shakur? Best believe as a journalist, Chuck Phillips was aware of the 1994 Vibe interview conducted by Kevin Powell. Chuck Phillips also published his own story relating to the Quad Studio shooting that was highly influenced by the Vibe magazine article. You, you got shot last year. Talk about this. This whole year has been a pretty heavy, Hell traumatic yeah. year since about no the doubt. end of '93 or something like that. No beginning doubt. of '94. Talk about that. Talk about a little bit about getting shot. I got shot five times by some dudes who wanted my jury. That's what they said. They wanted my jury, but I think they're trying to rub me out. Really. Don't you think that that would have been one of the biggest hip hop stories of 1995? The notorious B.I.G.'s wife, Faith Evans, records "Wonder Why You Call Your Bitch." with Tupac Shakur? I don't know if Chuck Phillips was on death row's payroll, but what I do know is what would have been the most explosive part of that recorded interview wasn't included in the published article, and it wasn't by mistake. He was asked not to include the part about Faith Evans being in the studio, and he obliged. You must understand, when you're being calculated, everything that's captured is not to be released immediately but in a calculated and timely manner. That recorded interview was Tupac's insurance policy. The fact that Tupac had just been released from prison because a female had fabricated the story about Tupac sexually assaulting her still didn't prevent Faith Evans from doing something similar and lying about the fact that she had recorded the song with Tupac. Faith Evans knew for a fact before she went to the studio that Tupac was signed to death row. Pay attention to her body language as she lies about how she didn't know that Tupac was signed to death row. I didn't know what was going on. And yeah. even when I went in the studio, until I walked in the studio, I didn't know Pac was signed to death row. What? Like, I immediately was like, oh, shit. Like, I knew all the people from just whatever I seen in the media. I saw probably, uh, I don't remember, maybe a Danny Boy. Corrupt, Corrupt, the dog Corrupt time. was there. You know what I mean? But I just started being the cool person I am, smoking with everybody, you know. Yep. I'm going to get this hook done. But I felt a little weird because 
I just didn't know he was on death row. Right. Faith Evans didn't know that she was being recorded by Chuck Phillips when he did the interview with Tupac because she was in the booth at the time he was recording her actually laying her vocals. Faith Evans would only find out after Tupac died that Tupac not only recorded his interview, but the actual studio session and Tupac's very respectful interactions. Chuck Phillips actually released the entire video after Tupac and Biggie's death. Do you think that if Faith knew she was being recorded, that she would have lied in the June 12, 1996 interview with Video Music Box, saying that, quote, it was never business with him and my voice is not on his album? Faith Evans thought that she was in the clear, so she proceeded to lie, knowing that Tupac didn't get clearance and her version of the song wasn't on his album. And upon Tupac's death, knowing that he couldn't respond, to the lies that would be later told in her book. If you remember, All Eyes On Me, the album was released on February 13, 1996, and Faith Evans' vocals had been replaced. There would be no need to release the song with her vocals because, remember, they had the recorded interview as proof and confirmation. That's why Tupac said this in this interview. I went to the studio straight from jail, 20 songs, double album, he's the nation. I got a song with Nate Dogg, I got a song with Roger, I got a song with George Clinton, I got a song with Dre, I got a song with Snoop, I got a song with Corrupt, Nas, Rage, Faith from Bad Boy. <laughs> I, got, I got a song with, that, with Faith from Bad Boy. We did this track together, so I wonder why they call you bitch. <laughs> The most interesting part about all of the interviews and articles that Faith Evans conducted is that no one bothered to do any due diligence to see if she was telling the truth. A lot of people like to mention Tupac's name when they want to clout chase or when they want views or clicks on their website or blog. And in the same breath, they'll talk about how great and legendary he was. But the craziest part about that is Tupac understood this hypocrisy wholeheartedly so if the media chooses to leave me alone i'm fine but if the media want to be there every time i have an extra drink every time i'm with more than five dudes then the people are gonna go oh look he's gangbang oh look he's getting drunk you know what i mean mm -hmm. all i want to do is live my normal life it's already not normal it's already with wherever i go people looking point on that like, i gotta go through that myself that's no problem but i don't need no new headaches just leave me alone when people call and say, guess what, I just saw Tupac, he was just a little bit, but let that shit go. It ain't news. I'm not news. Why am I always in the news? They had me in the news. I used to read shit when they used to be like, Sister Soldier got a new book coming out. Just like that other controversial dude, Tupac Shakur. I'm not even <laughs> in the story. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It'd be in the news. It's like, there was two murders yesterday. Not like when Tupac got shot, he made it, but everywhere is just Tupac. What are you going to do about this case, though? The lawsuit's coming, right? Yeah, I'm going to try to handle it. You know, I saw anything I could do is keep my head up and push through this shit. And until the wheels fall off, I'm going to still be me. Tupac's name carries so much weight that artists and journalists alike know that its authenticity will bring attention to their album or blog that only a few people would know exists unless they mentioned his name. Usually it's done by some type of comparison or suggestion, by saying that some new or less talented artist sounds like Tupac, or that they are the next Tupac, or laughably, that they're better than Tupac. Faith Evans was no different when it came time to write her book. A lie is always more entertaining than the truth, and the truth is always more simple than a lie. How did Faith Evans end up back at Tupac's hotel room the same night that she met him at the Hollywood Athletic Club? It was about 11.30 or 11.45 p.m. at the Hollywood Athletic Club on the 18th of October, 1995. Tupac wanted to smoke a cigarette, and he couldn't do it out front because it would have caused a lot of commotion, as very few people knew that he had been released from prison. So the security guard led Tupac to a side door where the red arrow was pointing, that opened up into the parking lot where nobody could really see him. So as we're outside and Tupac was smoking a cigarette, as we were chit-chatting and Tupac was talking about how happy he was to be home, that's when Faith and one of her friends who was with her were walking back to her red BMW, which was parked about 
three cars side by side away from where we were standing, where the white arrow is pointing. And that's when Tupac asked, as he was puffing on his cigarette, y'all leaving? And Faith replied, nah. And then Tupac said, we about to go back to my hotel. What y'all gonna do? And Faith said, we gonna follow you. And that's how she ended up back at Tupac's hotel the first night she met him after the party at the Hollywood Athletic Club. Yo, I'm outside the Hollywood Athletic Club right now. And right about here, as we were standing right by this door right here, when we came outside and um, he was smoking a cigarette and chilling right here, talking about how, you know, cool it was to be out of jail and the whole nine yards. This was uh, October 18th, 1995. And I'm going to turn around and I want you to see like approximately where that gray car is at right there. If you look over here, there's an entrance right here, but all of this stuff right here wasn't right there at that time. You could walk across. They walked across the parking lot right there. And as we stood right here, Tupac was smoking the cigarette. And he was like, he was like, y'all ready to leave? And it was like, nah, he said, because we about to um, go back to my hotel. He asked him, so what y'all going to do? And it was like, we're going to follow you. At the Hollywood Athletic Club on the 18th was the first night that we met Faith Evans. And that's where they hung out, smoked weed, and discussed the intricacies about Faith's guest appearance on You Wonder Why They Called You Bitch and what label Tupac was signed to. You see, Faith Evans would have you believe in her memoir that the reason she went back to Tupac's hotel room again the next night after the studio was to retain her mythological $25,000. But no, the truth is much more simple. Faith Evans was a woman scorned. Yeah, but um, I was in L.A. just to try and get my right and stuff and make some money. I didn't want to go on that big bad boy tour. I thought I was avoiding drama by not going on tour with my husband and his girlfriend and his mistress. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's what I thought, but it's all good. And Tupac's charisma and kindness mixed with that thug shit was simply irresistible. And that night after the studio in Tupac's hotel room was the night that spawned those 11 infamous words and the song hit him up. And I quote, you claim to be a player, but I fucked your wife. That was the reason why in her book, Faith Evans tried to make it seem like it was 26 days later after the Waiting to Exile soundtrack release party that she recorded the song. Yo, what up, it's your boy Delray. Yo, this is the infamous hotel where Tupac came after that night after the Hollywood Athletic Club when he met Faith Evans and uh, like I said she volunteered uh, by saying that she would follow him back to his hotel. The Peninsula. infamous uh, Peninsula Hotel, five star, five diamond hotel in Beverly Hills, California. Uh, and this is where those infamous words uh, that Tupac wrote and hit him up were inspired from. He was that kind of guy. Because of the simple fact, if you knew that she went back to Tupac's hotel room on the 18th, the first night that she met him, and that the song was recorded on the 19th, the very next day, then you would have been able to figure out that Tupac explained to Faith that he was now on death row and that he had had sex with her the second night after he met her. You must understand, there is no way on God's green earth that Tupac talked about recording a song with Faith, making her a guest appearance, and the song would be recorded the next day, but there would be no mention or discussion on Tupac's part about what label Tupac was under or who's going to cut the check. Or better yet, who just bailed Tupac out of prison? Faith Evans was signed to Bad Boy Records. She knew how that process worked. It's always been Faith Evans' notion that the January 14th, 1996 New York Times Magazine article titled Does a Sugar Bear Bite by Lynn Hirschberg is what alarmed Bigger about her and Tupac's relationship. 
because back to that scene, when you say he came and he heard about it, that was really what you started talking about. Yeah, exactly. That happened, you know? Right. He was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, like, you're blocking. But I think it was more so him hearing about uh, the bigger situation. And, 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 and this is the picture, or this is after Hit Him Up came out? Um, no, this is before Hit Him Up, ain't Yeah, I think that's before Hit Him Up. It's the picture then. The uh, the article. Picture. It was an article saying that no, I traded in my wedding ring. I think the picture yeah, came out Yeah, the picture off. was one thing, but there was yeah. an article with Suge and Tupac, and Suge was like, I um, I traded him in my wedding ring and took him shopping, bought him a bunch. I bought him the oh, outfit oh, he had on oh, in the magazine. Oh, it's MTV. That was MTV. Oh, I don't know what it was, but it was, all, was it also an article that okay, I'm they were talking about the same stuff. So I, I, you're right. It might have right. been a video somewhere, too. Right. In which the article talks about Faith Evans taking Tupac shopping, and buying him some shirts, a couple of pair of jeans, a suit, and some other stuff, according to Suge Knight. It doesn't specify the day, but Death Row publicist George Price can be overheard on Chuck Phillips' taped interview talking about Tupac shopping at the Beverly Center. Did he start on Friday? He started Friday. He didn't work Friday. Well, Friday, yeah. I think he went to uh, Newsweek, saw him, by the way, in the Beverly Center. Mm -hmm. And they called me. Mm -hmm. Allison. Mm -hmm. And I think that must have been Friday or something. Yeah, I think he was shopping. I know he was here. Mm -hmm. I would say I, Saturday. I would say Saturday when you started. So Saturday, Sunday, he's been in here every day? Or what? Well, Tuesday. Uh -huh. Today's Thursday. Today's Thursday. Tuesday, he had 12 tracks because she told me. Yeah. So I figured maybe that he went to work Saturday. Yeah, over the weekend. Or Sunday. Because mm -hmm. I know he's been in a few malls. I guess he had to buy clothes and stuff. Because people had spotted him and knew Call he was on the call. That sounds to me like four or five thousand at best, and not the forty or fifty thousand that recently has been reported. I can't see somebody spending fifty thousand dollars to allegedly make twenty five thousand dollars for singing background vocals. If true, then Faith Must wasn't trying to pitch in on the weed that same night in the studio because Natasha Walker said that Faith Evans told her that she was broke. So, um, how I know all the business is that when we got into it, she's like, oh, what are you doing? Yeah, 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 And, um, part of like, you know, by the board, kind of telling them, play this song or whatever. And then he's like, I'm going to smoke. And then, so, um, we were like, yeah, we got something. And so, um, she, she face was like, I ain't got nothing. I ain't got no money. I ain't got, I can't put nothing on it. Because after we had smoked that, it was like, nobody had any bud. So, you know, we were all like, well, we got something y'all take in, Lord. She was like, I'm broke. And, you know, and I was sitting on the couch, and I was like, girl, you broke. She said, girl, I ain't got no money. And that's what she started telling me about the tour. And mm -hmm. she said how they were doing her own tour. She didn't have no money. She just left me. Actually, they, they kicked her off tour, and she just came on back here, broke as hell. I said, girl, you are Faith Evans with the number one city. And girl, make a call. So I called my buddies and them. Uh, they worked at the uh, Century City Club. They had a big, uh, all these big clubs around. So I got her hired at all these little clubs that week. Now, after that, she was all happy and stuff. At any rate, by suggesting that magazine article as the reason, Faith Evans is making another feeble attempt to push the timeline further out into January 1996 so that you don't focus on the months of October and November 1995. Because not only did Biggie find out about Faith hanging out with Tupac at the Hollywood Athletic Club on the 18th of October, but 25 days later, the night before the Waiting to Exhale soundtrack release party on November 13th, 1995, when she would run into Tupac again, MTV aired the behind the scenes making of the California Love video. And Tupac, knowing he had that tape recorded studio session, said this. Oh why yeah. I why it took so long to make it that took song. a while, man, because you know, once you got that much love in the studio, yeah. hey, it take a while to get it down on oh, wax. So me and her took a while. Faith, my home girl. I just want to send a shout out to Faith. <laughs> hey girl, Faith and Bad Boy Records. So I guess Biggie wasn't mad about the MTV statement. And according to Faith's book, she wasn't mad about the MTV statement either, because Tupac sat at her table at the soundtrack release party the next day. That first public statement from Tupac not only confirmed the studio session, but it also suggested that something more personal had occurred. When Charlemagne the God on The Breakfast Club asked Faith Evans this question, her reaction said it all. So he never <laughs> believed you when you told him you didn't sleep with Pac, I guess? He never, no, he, 
You said never believed me. Yeah, he me. never believed you? He never made me think he didn't believe me. I don't need Faith Evans to tell me about whether Biggie believed her or not about Hit Him Up. Because the lyrics from Jay-Z's Brooklyn's Finest, Hypnotize, and the video as well as the song Get Money told me that Biggie didn't believe Faith. On August 11th, 1996 at the House of Blues, which was the second to last time I saw Tupac alive, we all entered the House of Blues together. Tupac, myself, Melly Mel and Scorpio from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, my friend Carlito, and a couple of the outlaws. This is actually the night that Tupac ran into Nas, and it was all love. And Tupac actually spoke about this in his last known interview. I remember that night like it was yesterday, because I asked Tupac as we stood outside the foundation room, did he have sex with Faith after the Hollywood Athletic Club that night? And he said no, but I did the next day, though. It was just curiosity on my part. I didn't give it much thought, because who knew he would be gone 30 days later? As our conversation shifted to my question about his Versace slip-ons that I thought looked like jailhouse scuffs, we were interrupted by a photographer who took two or three photos of Tupac by himself and one with me and Tupac as we stood outside the foundation room entrance. The craziest part about that night is I haven't been able to locate the photographer or the photographs until this day. The last time I would see Tupac alive was on August 30th, 1996, when I was driving my homegirls from Maryland around sightseeing, and I ran into Tupac in traffic in Hollywood, and my homegirl snapped this infamous photo. Eight days later, he would be shot in Las Vegas, and six days later, he would be pronounced dead. Rest in peace.